Okay, good. All righty. Welcome, everyone, to New Year. Uh, I'll kick this uh, OTSC call off. Uh, my name is Ted Young. I work at LightStep and uh, spend a lot of time contributing to the Open Tracing Project. Um, since there's no uh, uniform list, I'm just going to call people's names out uh, and go around. And if you could just say a little thing about who you are and a one sentence uh, about your relationship to Open Tracing, that'd be great. So uh, let's start with Manu. Hello everyone, I'm Manu, software engineer at Datadog. Uh, my relationship with open tracing is uh, working for the Python implementation and I've been uh, contributing to that one. Great. Uh, Yuri? Uh, hi. Um, I work at Uber, uh, working on open tracing and the Jaeger, uh, the tracing system at CNCF. Great. Uh, ben S? Uh, he just popped out. Um, Warren? Maybe Warren can't hear us or uh, can't unmute. Let's keep going. Uh, there's someone named Dan Kubrick. Yeah, hi, uh, Dan Kubrick. I work with uh, Chris Irway at SolarWinds, so uh, into distributed tracing and just kind of uh, tuning in to stay abreast while uh, he's out for a little bit. Great, you can see it. Uh, Derek Haynes, welcome. Hi, um, I work at Scout and we're primarily interested in open tracing with Python. Nice. Uh, e. Arnold. Hi, I'm Erica Arnold. I work at, I'm an engineer at New Relic and also just tuning in to pay attention, watching Open Tracing, getting excited. Great. Nice to see you. Uh, Dave Anderson. Hello, Dave Anderson. I work with Derek at Scout App. Um, we're primarily interested in um, Python Open Tracing implementation right now. Great. We've got Jonathan Caldor on the call. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan from Facebook. I work on our uh, distributed tracing platform called Canopy. Um, and I'm here mostly to hear about other people's experiences and talk about our experiences as well. Great. We see we got Gary Brown on the call. I um, work for Red Hat on uh, distributed tracing technologies. Uh, so open tracing, uh, we contribute to Jaeger. Um, recently been dabbling in Envoy and Istio. Nice. Good to see you. Pavel? Hi, I'm software engineer at Red Hat. I work on Jaeger and open tracing, and I'm, I work with Gary Brown. Great. And then we got uh, Ben S. Looks like he's popped back on. Well, anyways, Ben Singleman is from Lightstep, and he's also hanging around and works on the OTSC specification. Um, so let's uh, kick it off. Um, we've got uh, a couple brief updates about languages. Um, the Java API is about to go out, so we should spend a little bit of time talking about that. It would be great to get a Python update from Manu. Um, and then uh, after that, what I would like to do with this particular call, uh, since there's nothing else on the agenda, is to just sort of have a round table discussion about a couple bigger issues. Uh, uh, around project structure with language maintainers, and then uh, sort of a dynamic linking issue that I can get into. Um, so hopefully we can save at least 30 minutes for those, those two topics together. Um, but to just start it off with the Java API, that's a um, pretty big deal. A uh, lot of work went into that, and I believe we're now finally, finally, finally at the end. Um, there's a single sort of patch issue that's outstanding right now, um, which I should link to, uh, but uh, that involves just having um, the old baseband as a sort of stub, uh, stub interface, uh, which was solving some like dependency circles I think Yuri was having. So you know, that's sort of the one final thing. Uh, Yuri, do you want to just say a moment about that? And then I think, Pavel, you had some questions about that one. So it would be great if we could hash that out and just uh, get that thing in, because it's sort of the last. Yeah, the, the problem is that um, 
there, there is a lot of instrumentation which uh, upgraded to 030 without actually changing any code because they were not using active span uh, concept. However, <clears throat> however, once it was compiled against 030, there was a, like a reference to this base span class recorded in the, in the binaries. Uh, and now if you try to run the same binaries um, with a 031, uh, aside from that base class, basically everything would have worked because there's no API dependency still, but it still blows up because the class is not found in the new jar. Uh, and, and that manifests as a runtime dependency, unfortunately. So um, it's, it's kind of nasty for people to discover that at runtime, uh, even mm -hmm. though let's say they upgrade like either Jaeger or open tracing uh, API and then suddenly it blows up on some other library. So that, like by simply introducing this interface as a dynamic class, uh, that seems to solve that issue. Okay, sweet. And Pavel, I think you had some concerns. Uh, have you had a chance to think about this more? I didn't have a chance to, to play with it, but uh, I think it, it looks a little bit weird, that fix. Yeah, I felt like I wasn't a uh, strong enough um, Java programmer to, to really grok um, uh, how, how it works or what, what about the dependency chain. Something to do with um, something's a base span and then it just gets upgraded to the regular new span interface, which has all the methods it was looking for and then it works. Is that kind of how the, the mechanism here? You read, did it fail actually on the loading, right? It yeah, fails on the loading, yeah. But I think it can fail on the on the runtime because it's different, different well, class or interface. It, loads, it's, it blows up on the runtime when loading the classes, yes. It's certainly at the startup of the application, um, but still people wouldn't be, um, like they wouldn't find it at compile time. Mm -hmm. so I guess. Mm. It seems like a small thing to <clears throat> to give to give in just to have that class rather than uh, basically cause pain again with the upgrade. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty minor thing. Uh, it doesn't affect tracers or users to have this stub in there. Um, I just I felt like I I couldn't quite wrap my head around uh, why it why it solved the problem. But uh, if if you feel confident that it does. Um, I think we should, there's no great reason to not put it in personally. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, let's move that discussion to uh, the PR or out of band uh, from here, uh, but let's try to get that in or, or otherwise uh, resolved uh, by end of day today. Um, and uh, I believe that's, that is the last issue that's been raised uh, about uh, the 31 API. Yuri, do you feel like uh, you would be satisfied uh, given the work you've been doing on Jaeger and porting it over uh, to release on Monday if we put this in? Yeah, that would be good. Okay, great. Excited guys, finally made it. Okay. And then someone uh, tacked on a, a single point here about uh, update for contrib modules. Um, yeah, it was it was me. And mostly uh, we started migrating all our Java Tracer to the new API, but because in the Java agent we are using uh, open tracing contrib modules, uh, uh, I saw that some work was already scheduled and done uh, to ship some release candidate. Uh, I just want to have uh, uh, an update about uh, the remaining modules, uh, the remaining contrib modules. Yeah. So what is the plan? Uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of time, of course. <laughs> I, I think we need to, to just, uh, and this sort of dovetails with the language maintainers discussion, but yeah, we need to just uh, make sure every Java uh, uh, instrumentation we can find uh, gets ported and possibly leaves a, a tag or branch um, for the version that works with the 30 API, I suppose. Uh, uh, come up with like a, a tag OT v030 or something like that. So people have a consistent way of being able to find that older one. Um, that would be my suggestion for how we do it. But uh, it'll mostly just be uh, 
I think contacting the maintainers of each piece of instrumentation and, and asking them to do the work or, you know, doing the PRs themselves from some of the, the core groups that have Java staff uh, who can uh, push on that. But that's, that's basically it. Okay, perfect. From that point of view, uh, I think that we are using a couple of integrations uh, that are not currently ported. Uh, so maybe we can uh, contribute. I have to ask to Tyler that he's helping uh, us uh, with the Java part. Okay, great. I'll get a hold of him. Uh, and okay. All right, I think that's it for Java. Uh, let's move on to Python. Uh, Manu, yes. do you have an update? Yeah, so uh, currently, okay, because of Christmas and so on, we didn't uh, spend a lot of time uh, doing some uh, updates. Uh, I just want to tell uh, the action items for the next week, uh, because uh, the first issue is that we didn't have uh, uh, a lot of reviews about the, the API implementation, the, sorry, the API specification and the implementation. And just uh, from, uh, okay, of course, for me and from uh, Carlos. Um, what I'm going to do next week is uh, addressing all the comments from Carlos uh, that are pretty easy at the moment, at the very, at this state. Uh, would be great if someone, uh, maybe people that are in this, uh, uh, in this meeting, uh, interesting about open tracing Python, uh, if we can have some uh, feedback about that, because uh, for us, actually, it's working. Uh, internally, we are uh, already using uh, part of it uh, for some services, uh, not everywhere. And uh, But yeah, having more feedbacks would, would be great. Awesome. Uh, does the mock tracer support that? The propagation so, API? Uh, so for, for the Python implementation, uh, no, I mean, I've just uh, provided the basic tracer implementation, so the real tracer. Okay. Uh, I think, yes, it's, uh, it's missing. It's a missing part, but yeah. It will, in, a, in any case. Okay, so for us, uh, because most of uh, Uber instrumentation is in the uh, open trace instrumentation uh, library, uh, so if that were, and I think that one has unit tests against basic tracer. I believe. Yeah. If that works, exactly. uh, then that's probably a good validation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that work is just basically in flight. Um, and if people want to get involved, uh, the Open Tracing Python channel on Gitter is a great place to ask questions or ask, hey, how can I help? Um, and uh, uh, Manu here is, is currently uh, uh, driving that. All righty. Um, unless people have any other uh, language API questions or, or, you know, sort of nitty gritty they want to discuss, uh, I'd like to move on to a couple of looser roundtable discussions. So just one last call. Does anyone have any sort of day-to-day -day business they want to make sure they get done? Uh, at this call today. Sounds like nope, but we can tack something on at the end if you think of it. All right. So something I really would like uh, uh, to uh, move and I would like to make a proposal soon is around some kind of new amount of structure uh, to the open tracing project itself. I've been kind of calling this a language maintainer role but uh, to describe just sort of the issue that I see, <clears throat> I think there's just a, a, a sprawling amount of stuff involved in open tracing because it's just a huge project that spans all of the languages. Uh, and there's very few people who have broad expertise that is across all of these languages. So one way to divide up the work that makes a lot of sense is to sort of divide it up by language with the language API issues and PR requests around changes to that, and then uh, sort of uh, maintaining the ecosystem around um, uh, the instrumentation for that language. Uh, not necessarily doing all of the work, but at least uh, sorting to kind of have a set of people who are kind of bottom lining and making sure the work is getting done. 
And then there's a sort of set of maybe uh, structural things around uh, how our pull requests made, uh, templates for issues, when someone makes an issue, have a template to start off with. Um, if uh, an issue or a pull request can't get resolved right away, what should we do with that? Should we create milestones? Uh, should we close those issues, et cetera, et cetera? There's just a, a certain amount of the, the process of, of moving through these issues and making these decisions that I think would be, if there were, <clears throat> there was a way for people to sign up uh, to kind of bottom line those things or be, be officially part of it, um, uh, or a way to identify you'd like to take on or take part in that work, uh, I think that would help encourage people to kind of step up to the plate. Um, and it would be great to start creating some working groups around those kinds of issues rather than just use this OTSC call uh, to deal with some of those nitty gritty project details. So that's the, the kind of vague thing I feel like uh, this project could use right now. And I'm curious, one, what, what other people think, and two, uh, have people had experience in the past with uh, this kind of uh, open source project structure and suggestions uh, for other projects to look at, uh, things they like, things they would hope we would avoid. Uh, so I'd just like to open the floor up to any comments uh, on this subject. Okay, so um, one thing uh, that I, I was thinking some, uh, some days ago was mostly related to um, uh, organizing each uh, single project specification or the basic implementation so that issues are uh, a good part of where we have discussions mostly. So um, we already talked about that, but I want to, uh, to push that topic again uh, because sometimes, uh, um, okay, we have language maintainers uh, so let's say a set of people working around the Python API, let's say. Uh, the point is uh, it would be great, uh, of course, uh, getting feedbacks from uh, vendors, uh, from uh, whoever, I mean. And the point is uh, sometimes we get uh, discussions on Gitter and uh, sometimes on the mailing list, it depends. Uh, my, my idea was, uh, what do you think if, uh, Okay, these language maintainers are also kind of moderators of uh, GitHub issues where discussion, technical discussions uh, happen instead of GitHub, let's say. So having uh, the repository, the source of truth, the, of truth about the um, development of new features or uh, feedbacks or stuff like that. Um. Yeah, I certainly like the idea of making sure there's some official channel for where these discussions are happening or in general being able for people in the community to be able to find the discussions. I think that's an issue. I don't know if GitHub issue, I mean, I think GitHub issues are a great, are a place to discuss it and a, a good place. They still, there's still this sort of, um, it, if you wander into an open source project that you're not already deeply involved with, I find the if the project is of any meaningful size, the issues and PRs, because there's no way to sort of sort and order them manually, uh, it's hard to tell what's big, what's small, what's moving fast, what's, what's just sort of hanging around there. Um, so uh, I think one thing I would like to get a working group going on is like, how can we pave over those issues and kind of like the issues with the issues <laughs> uh, to sort of make sure when people land in open tracing, they can also uh, find those discussions. So I guess it's, I would just add on to there. It's not just uh, monitoring the discussions, but making sure uh, people in the community are, are aware of them, having some channel for, for getting that information out there. I think we've discussed that before, having an update section on the website or maybe just a regular blog post or something like that. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Um, but, Ted, what kind of uh, classes of issues do you see? Classes of issues? 
because you usually uh, the like for example on the specification uh, we have issues for quite a while having to do with let's say new reference type or this debug ID. Um, so the, yeah, they, they kind of linger and uh, it's hard to see what 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 we're going to do about them. Um, but some other issues seem to be resolved fairly quickly. Yeah, I think some some issues can get resolved quickly. Some other issues, either something seem they seem to come in a couple classes. Like this seems like a good idea, but we can't agree on a solution. Or maybe it's a good idea, but people aren't fully convinced yet. Um, and in particular, uh, there are I think some pull requests and issues where some people say. Uh, hey, this would be nice. And other people say, yeah, I don't know about it. And then it just sort of trails off, right? Uh, and part of that is I feel like people don't know who has what um, authority or, or what the mechanism actually is to resolve debates like that or where they should go at that point. Mm. Um, so just having at least... Uh, to my mind, some some amount of responsibility placed on some people where you can at least say, hey, because this is Java, uh, and let's say Carlos Alberto is, you know, a Java language maintainer, you can say, like, assign him to that issue, and then it's his responsibility to to keep poking the people to get them to agree, or if they really can't agree, to have some way of, like, then closing that issue or discussion down by saying like looks like we've gotten as far as we can get this is like the final state where this landed and now we're going to to put this uh in some place where people can find it if it comes up again but uh we're not talking about it actively anymore so let's get it out of the sort of open issue area okay so a um, couple things i think we might want to introduce um some taxonomy of labels in this case. Uh, I think we need to decide like if the issue reaches a point where no one is convinced or something, or there is like a basically disagreement and we don't wanna, do we wanna close it or do we wanna just uh, park it and label it as parked uh, until further? Um, so that's one thing. Another thing I think we should add code owners files then into all the repos. Um, and then the third one is this is something we're doing uh, at Uber as part of our like my team OKRs. Uh, we, we have usually an OKR like respond to open source tickets within two days, right? Like an SLA uh, sort of. We may want to make it like one week for for this one, but um, at least there is some sort of like one of the owners should have a like the last response on the ticket, or the the ticket has to be reclassified into some other category. I think that sounds great. Um, yeah, you know, from my perspective, uh, we're just kind of getting started with open tracing. And there, there's really two things that I think cause a little bit of like, I call it like clean slate confusion. Um, the first is sometimes it's difficult to tell where a specific language implementation is at compared to the spec. and to do that right now, I've had to kind of like dig through issues and make kind of assumptions on things that I'm not always sure are correct. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, the second is, um, I think sometimes it, you know, for a vendor or for for someone else, if when they want to build on open tracing, there there, there could be some concern when you see uh, a, a number of of lingering issues because you know open tracing is evolving. There's going to be bugs and language specific implementations. Um, but if it looks like there's like a critical one that would impact how our agent works, which then bubbles down to our customers, then, then there's some, some concern on well, how, how quickly are critical things addressed. And I, I think as you guys are saying, I think a lot of the ones that hang out there are things that aren't critical. They're more like, uh, you know, they're more broader discussions, but it's not always obvious when you look at a list of issues, um, that that's the case. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I would also say, Derek, like I didn't put it on the list here, but in general, I would like us to 
uh, form a working group or otherwise start to overhaul our documentation and website in general, like I think we could just, it's just time to, to really improve that intro experience to people so they understand all of this stuff. It's all kind of there in the docs, kind of, but it's, yeah, I don't, I think it could be just be better. Yeah, and that's all normal, normal things at, at this stage. Yeah. Cool. That's, that's good. And I think part, part of that maybe is, do you, would you, if there was a, a prominent location that explained, like, you know, these are the maintainers for various languages or whatever, or, you know, basically a directory of, of if you have questions, here are the people who will respond to them. Um, I don't know what and maybe what, uh, how to contact them. Like what is the communication mechanism? Would that be a kind of thing you would use if you saw something like that? Would you do some reach out? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think in some cases, like I'd probably see a, who, who just made the most commits to the repository, maybe reach out. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, I think for just that clean slate, like what's like the general state of this? Like where where is it at um, compared to the spec? Um, is, is helpful. And, and yeah, we'll we'll share as we get started because we're kind of yeah. in, in that state. We'll we'll share some things that might help and contribute where we can. Awesome. Thanks for the feedback. Okay. Um, I kind of have some questions about, uh, how maybe the process of, you know, how, how do you add people to these roles? And then, uh, I guess potentially if you needed to, how would you like remove someone from one of these roles? Uh, personally, I would like to see this kind of stuff be very open. If someone just wants to raise their hand and say, I'd like to help, uh, for them to be able to 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 plug in and start start helping and so the maybe amount of responsibility any individual have could vary but the amount of total responsibility that the group per language has you know is is fixed and delineated um and so there's just some way to have a group of people per language who are maybe sorting sorting things out uh, amongst themselves as to how it's working. Um, but at the same time, you can see it'd be easy for this to turn into a tragedy of the commons where, uh, you know, there's a group of people and then no one picks up a thing or, or no one responds to a thing. Uh, and I've wondered if, if people have had experience with, with those issues on other projects and, and any advice uh, on that front. Well, typically you do need a list of maintain official maintainers, right? That's what code owners kind of comes in place. Uh, and uh, they uh, usually in all projects have the final say. Uh, I mean, so far we, we kind of delegated this to the, uh, to the spec commission, right? Uh, but uh, definitely um, people on that list are not necessarily experts in all languages. So... Uh, I think code owner is slightly different and that's the actual maintainers of the repo. Uh, and like if someone wants to help, there's like, it's GitHub, no one's stopping you to actually jump in and um, subscribe and this is basically offer opinions. And then uh, the, uh, the project governance should state how someone can become a, a maintainer. So we've recently added something like that to Jaeger uh, where you have a sort of like a voting process where uh, maintainers can elect or de-elect other maintainers. Uh, good idea. And we, we may, uh, like rather than duplicating this in all the, uh, each, each repos, we probably should consolidate it into uh, like the actual project governance consolidated in the specs repo. Uh, just make sure that, okay, that it applies to individual uh, languages differently uh, in terms of like who are the people, right? Because the, the actual people will be in the code owners in that repo. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I almost wonder if we need a sort of, uh, so right now it's, I think if someone says, hey, I want to do this, uh, it would be great if we didn't need too much of a formal voting process. Someone who had sort of administrator privileges just 
can say, yeah, you know, if you can convince anyone who has those privileges that you seem uh, uh, fine uh, for doing that work, then they could add you rather than having to wait for some, you know, OTSC meeting or something like that. Um, but it makes me feel like right now we just have this sort of specification council. And I wonder if we want to also maybe have just another administrator role, which would basically be the same people. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's just getting pedantic. Um, but as far as like who, who has the keys to all these various repositories and things, if you need to like, Hey, this person needs to get added as a, you know, a, they're a language maintainer, so they need to get permissions to all these various repositories and stuff like that. And can they become a language maintainer or not? Like maybe a list of like, who are the people who have those permissions and can give them out? Can you hear me now? Yeah. It's so frustrating. This entire call I've been on my phone until now, I heard everything. I kept on talking and like I called in three times and it didn't work. Anyway, oh. I have a bunch of comments that from previous discussions I will keep to myself or I'll tell you later, Ted, or whatever. But in terms of this thing, like I don't really want to create a bunch of structure that we don't need. I think like the to me the most I mean, I'm not I think we should do it like kind of on demand. And it does seem to me like there's a problem for sure with certain languages where it's actually in the contrib area where I feel like it's most <laughs> that's most prominent. Like there was a bunch of really good stuff that had been contributed to the Django and Flask stuff that was just like sitting there kind of dormant for months because I didn't notice it. And, you know, oh, well, you know, like that's a terrible situation. Like that, that should never happen. So to me, it's like just having someone who's on the hook to just make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen. It was pretty much as easy as like making one comment and then merging. It wasn't a difficult PR. Yeah. Um, and I just want to make sure that we have someone who's responsible for that, for just keeping track of that. And also someone who's, as you, someone said earlier, like a decider for issues. Like we just, I think there are a lot of situations with open tracing where people involved in this project are usually pretty smart and reasonable, which is great. So it would be nice if someone just had decision-making authority, even if the decision is to put something off, but just like, so it doesn't end up in the state that it's in now where you have some issues that they're not going to be resolved. We all know that, but no one feels like they have the, the God-given authority to just say, this is officially dormant or whatever, whether that means you close it or put a label on it. So I'm more interested in just having an individual that has those sorts of, those sorts of capabilities. And I'm a yeah. little bit reticent to like create lots of structure around permissions models and stuff like that. To me, this isn't really a governance issue in terms of people being bad actors and keeping, keeping bad actors under control. It's more like an issue of making sure that we can make decisions quickly when any, any one of us could make it if we were just granted the authority. So that, that's like my two cents. I think that's great. Um, I agree with a lot of that. I can't remember who said it, but I heard somewhere you should always uh, aim for just a little bit less structure than you think you need. Um, and uh, I think that's, I would definitely want to avoid anything that involves voting or some like official process. Uh, we should just think a little bit about like, you know, what are we going to put on the website around if you'd like to be take on this role, you know, how do you raise your hand and say, I would like this. And then who says, okay, fine, you're on the list. Uh, so yeah. we just think a little bit about what that, that process would look like. I mean, look where voting, voting got us in the United States. Like, no, no one wants this. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so maybe it's just as simple as um, telling people to come into Gitter and say that you would like to do this, and then we will just notice you and, and, and do something about that. But, uh, or the OTSC can bottom line that for now. Uh, and that's there may be some amount of tapping people on the shoulder and asking, I think, too. It's not the kind of thing where I'd expect people to be volunteering, even if they would like to do it. Um, but mm -hmm. it's not like a huge responsibility in the terms of time commitment. It just requires like someone to know that they're doing it. Yeah. And uh, for, for the contrib repos, I agree. That's where probably the most, like, the biggest issue around, like, uh, people making a pull request or an issue and then it, like, not getting responded to is probably uh, much greater there than in the language repos just because there's so many more contrib repos uh, and there's this issue of well there's always going to be you know whoever's the sort of maintainer for that thing but you know people kind of come and go uh, I think people might might love a big uh, open source project that they're working on and like devote their life to it but if it's just 
some piece of instrumentation uh, for some library that you're using at some point in your career. We should kind of expect people who, who write those things will then move on uh, and the, the maintainers of those instrumentations will have to like change over time. Um, and so that's sort of where I see things like, you know, the Django and Flask things, for example, where I think those were cases where the person who originally wrote that code had like moved on and wasn't necessarily paying attention to it anymore. Um, so language maintainers being the people who kind of get those GitHub alerts and are just paying attention to those things. Maybe it's just as simple as having an SLA for how long a PR and issue can sit anywhere before it gets assigned to someone for review. That sounds like a good one. I like Yuri's SLA idea a lot too. It doesn't, as long as it's written down, any, anything would be good. Just, it won't, the SLA will not be six months, you know, like yeah. for a person Django's. If the yeah, SLA is basically, if you are raising your account to be added to code owners, then you essentially taking on that SLA. Yeah. And if those SLAs are easy for people to find when they make PRs or issues, then that just lets them know when they have a question, they can at least know like, oh, I was supposed to get someone assigned to this uh, two days ago. So I now feel empowered to like go like raise this to somebody and I can see on the list who I should ask like, hey, what's going on here? I think that those are the kind of things that would make people who aren't part of the core community, but are making a PR an issue, just feel like they have a handle on what kind of next steps they're supposed to take. Sweet. All right. Um, and I see it's now 9-11. Uh, uh, and uh, I feel like we've had a pretty good discussion on this. There's also some dynamic linking I'd like to talk about. Uh, does anyone else uh, have anything they'd like to raise or discuss on the language maintainer? Just subject? one thing, I, I actually be, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but it'd be great to hear from people um, specifically at New Relic and, um, and uh, the, the folks who have previously spent time at Avenetta who are on this call and stuff to understand how uh, just from an organizational standpoint, language maintenance worked for the agents. I don't think it's not the same thing when we're not writing agents here, but it reminds me of that where you probably have some common data format and model, and then you have teams doing this stuff. I bet there's some similarities in terms of the way this stuff is structured. And if there's some kind of like TLDR lessons learned, like don't do it this way, do it this way kind of thing about just how to structure the per language stuff in conjunction with some larger data model um, that that crosses between languages, I would be curious to hear about it. Again, that if you have, if you, if you feel like saying it now, great. If it's something that happens offline, that's great too. But I, I would love to hear um, the parallels between kind of APM agents per language and the situation we find ourselves in now. Yeah, the, the biggest one to me, Ben, with the, especially with the contrib area, um, I, th I think that had, would, just has a tendency to eventually kind of become abandoned where because you solve a problem, and then you move on. And then your organization probably stays on those same versions for a long time. Um, one thing that just might be really helpful for the contrib, for example, in the readme is like for Python, Django, like which Python version was this tested against, which, Zang which Django version was this tested against. Just because I think what can happen is someone might start trying to use those contrib, those contrib modules. And if they start having a pretty bad experience, like, oh, it doesn't work for Python 3, or oh, shoot, it doesn't work for this, but it wasn't clear. And then they had that same experience in other languages, they can give open tracing kind of a, a bad name um, when it can just, just get clear, like, this is what it works against. This is, this is what we tested against. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, um, from New Relic's perspective, um, this is very similar. You're right, there's a lot of um, parallels uh, one of the things that I wrestle with um, currently in my job is to try to aim for consistency across all of our agents. Um, and one of the things that's the most helpful for me is just being able to track inconsistencies where they occur. These languages agents have been built over years. There's lots of inconsistencies, um, but being able to explain them and just know the what happens under each situation and having that documented in a single place has been really helpful um, to just start to reason about how to make them more consistent if that's the goal. That's great feedback.
And yeah. I guess from the uh, reporting from the formerly Apneta camp, um, so uh, for us, I think probably, um, you know, consistency, definitely a challenge. And um, I think one of the things that, that I was really interested in when I first, you know, was kind of working on some of the open tracing docs is the semantic specification, because when you start to get these, I guess, you know, now they're in contrib, but basically these kind of modules that instrument various items of functionality, there's certain kind of guarantees that uh, if you know that like a database instrumentation is always going to report these things or, you know, RPC, HTTP, you know, client instrumentation is always going to report method and status like that. Um, that really helps you kind of downstream. So from a vendor perspective, I think one of the things that helped us at least, uh, you know, try to get uniformity is you basically have these internal spec documentations about like, if you want something to show up as like an HTTP client, then you'd better capture these things. And then there's certain optional extensions of that, but there's like a minimum bar. Uh, so that's, you know, I think the kind of semantic specification might turn into a guideline for that. In terms of uh, organization, we basically have like, you know, one direct code owner that uh, is in charge of kind of the um, internals implementation of it. And so that's going to vary from, uh, from runtime to runtime or language to language. Uh, there might be other people who are contributing to that. Um, and then there's, there's, you know, it's all kind of obeying that broader, uh, kind of semantic, uh, spec. And that's a little bit more like a, almost like a wire protocol, um, type view of things that open tracing doesn't really have the kind of luxury of but you know it's almost like if you just view it as the api is like the wire protocol but like one step higher then it's really really similar um and then i guess lastly to the version things that's definitely a huge problem um and so we have these kind of like matrix you know testing things where it's like run you know these versions in line with like these versions and basically like I guess with contrib style, you'd almost want to pull those into your build and like run those on your matrix to figure out, you know, what's going to work on Python two versus Python three and so on. But um, it's uh, it, it is a challenge. Uh, automation is probably probably the best way to keep track of it because stuff will go still fast. I mean, I, I guess there's there's other people working on this as well, not just you know formerly Appnetta and uh, and New Relic. So I'm I'm always curious to hear how other people are organizing this too. Yeah, I think you've hit on all the major the major aspects of this though. Okay, great. That was I think a a great. Uh, set of um, issues uh, and targets uh, for what this role should be that was raised. I'll try to take this and, and synthesize it uh, into a document and make a, a GitHub issue out of it on the specification repo um, in the next couple of days. Uh, but yeah, and if anyone else is interested in collaborating on this work, of course, see me the issue or, you know, contact me and get her. All righty. <clears throat> so we only have a little bit of time left, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, and I just wanted to first raise some awareness about another front opening up on the op for the open tracing project, which is around dynamic linking. Uh, so this has really kind of started with service meshes and proxies, such as Envoy uh, in particular, but also Nginx, um, Linkerd, and... Uh, other pieces of software that essentially are what in the past I've called network appliances. The, these are pieces of software that generally you're not writing, you're just deploying. And you'd like to have the tracer that you use uh, trace what's going on in these things because they're often in band uh, with the requests going through your system. Uh, Kubernetes ingress, another example of where this shows up. And in all of these cases, you have a sort of way of getting um, that code distributed to you that is not that you are then mutating that code and compiling it yourself, right? You have a binary distribution, a package distribution, something of that nature. Um, and those projects don't want to bake in every single tracer ever written and be sort of in line to a sort of like a, a down they don't want to be part of 
however you're getting updates to that tracer and that other piece of technology, uh, if they bake all of that in uh, to each project, then they're one, having to pick a winner, and two, they end up in their own version of like dependency hell because whatever dependencies all these different tracer clients need, they end up taking on all of those dependencies. And they may even be incompatible with each other. Um, and so what is looking more and more interesting on that front is some form of dynamic linking where uh, perhaps there's some kind of uh, set of some set of tracers that are baked into these things by default. But if you roll Envoy out, for example, you'd like to then uh, dynamically link Jaeger or Lightstep or New Relic or something like that into, um, into Envoy uh, at runtime and to have two distribution channels for how uh, you're deploying these things and, and getting them onto your machine. Uh, so that, that's a thing that's, that's coming up as we start to get more and more integrated with the uh, sort of infrastructure layer that people are running, uh, running their programs on. So my first question is, does what I just said make sense to people uh, or should I clarify it more? And my second question is, what are people's experiences with this kind of dynamic linking? Uh, do people have suggestions uh, for uh, deployment models for this sort of thing in this new sort of Docker image world that we live in? Is this a language specific program, problem though, right? So there's one part that's language specific, which is, the, the three languages where we've kind of seen this come up so far are C++, Go, and Java. And they all have different kinds of runtime linking mechanisms. So, so that part is certainly language specific. Uh, I don't think it will extend beyond those languages, maybe Rust, but that's mostly what, what people write infrastructure stuff in. So it's gonna be those three. Um, the part that does seem a little cross language is there's some way to, there's some format for passing configuration to the tracer where you're going to write some kind of configuration thing uh, in, uh, you know, uh, as part of your configuration for Envoy or, or Linker D, and then that has to get passed over to the tracer. Uh, so that was one place where having some standardization that was maybe cross language would be nice as well. Yeah, that's interesting to me. I, I totally agree with that, Ted, about the, um, the static configuration of the tracers themselves. Is the, it's interesting because, like, in the specification, we've struggled at times, for instance, with the idea of like, it's. I think most, if not all, like, real tracer implementations have some tags that are passed to the tracer that then get applied to every span or something like that. We don't have a place to like really reify that because the the way that tracer are configured isn't part of the specification, it's just kind of a convention. But we would have to, I think, well, it would be beneficial if we could describe things like that in this, um, in the static configuration for tracers. Um, I also think another use case that you didn't mention, Ted, but I think is sort of interesting. There's a, a like, I think there's a false dichotomy between open tracing approach and like a traditional agent that reaches in from the outside. It is possible to write some kind of agent that um, uses open tracing. In fact, I think there's some kind of fledgling project in the JVM world that does exactly that. But configuring something like that, it would also be nice to, um, to be able to plug in an arbitrary tracer implementation uh, dynamically. And, and mm. I, like, I, can see, I can see other applications of this for sure beyond just the infrastructure software, but they all need some way. It would be great not to have different configuration for these tracers from language to language, where I think I'd imagine that for almost everyone, the 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 parameters for any given um, tracer, it has more to do with where the data is being sent than what language is being written in, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So it sounds like the presentation is going to be specific to the, to the like, Light Steps Tracer and Jaeger will always have different parameters, and that's not a bad thing. Like, that's because they're different systems. So, you know, that, that's, um, right. it, we won't be able to have a standard format, so, so to speak. No, but it's more like you're going to get a blob of JSON and then there's going to be like this key and then all of your tracer specific stuff will be off of that. It, it, it seems like there's just a little bit of that. Um, I linked, by the way, I linked to the, uh, the, there's a PR for this in Envoy that I linked to uh, in the notes, but I'll throw into 
uh, the chat here, just if people want to see a concrete example of, of what we're talking about here. Um, that's, that's one place where this is happening live. Which is also why I'd like us to address it as a group, because it's kind of happening right now, because people need it. Uh, but it's happening sort of project by project. So it's interesting. I mean, Jaeger clients have always provided a uh, sort of a configuration class which acts as a factory for the tracer. We never recommend creating tracer manually. Um, and uh, configuration typically either it, it can read environment variables or a config file. Um, although, like with the config file, you run into like format issues. Um, like most of our libraries sort of either punt on the format completely and let you do that or uh, like in, in, in Node it would expect uh, like a dictionary or um, JavaScript JSON file, something like that. So that, that part of standardization is a bit uh, difficult, but that's like mostly limited to, to the um, individual system. Um, and the, the point about like uh, having a sort of a common key in Envoy configuration, that seems like it, that's just the Envoy concern. Like they can extract that key and pass what's under it to the tracer. Uh, and But we would need, uh, I think, at the open tracing level then to have this sort of the SPI um, interface saying that this is uh, a general factory interface that can mm -hmm. create a tracer. Yeah. So, so one example of where the standardization should be beyond just the project is, so let's say you make a, a C++ tracer that could be dynamically linked and Envoy offers dynamic linking to C++ tracers. And then Nginx open tracing is an open tracing module that also offers dynamic linking to C++ tracers. And uh, it would be great if you could just make one, you know, C++ tracer binary uh, or tracer, you know, shared object file, and it's going to work with Nginx, with Envoy, with anything else that's doing some form of open tracing, you know, uh, dynamic linking. So there's at least a, a bit of, you know, that that's where I see the standardization. You don't want people having to write a dynamically linked Nginx plugin and a dynamically linked Envoy plugin and a like. So that's sort of what I would like to see. Uh, get standardized. And then the other question that's just sort of a bigger question is, I'm not, it's not totally clear to me what the best distribution mechanisms are for some of these things. Like if you want to add Nginx ingress, uh, if you want to, that has Nginx open tracing baked into it now, but it just has like Zipkin on by default. And if you wanted to add Jaeger or New Relic to Nginx ingress, like what would be the actual mechanism for that? That's more probably Kubernetes to decide that, but I'm wondering if people have any history with, with how they, they glue these things together at deployment time. Right now, I'm just thinking packages and Docker images. I'm generally of the immutable camp, they get in, but mm -hmm. that's me. Yep. Anyways, food for thought, uh, that's, that's a sort of uh, thing that's just starting to develop right now. So again, if, if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, uh, uh, say hi on Gitter, uh, you can ping me. Uh, Ryan Byrne has been working on this stuff at the sort of C++ level. And uh, uh, Sergey, I believe, was just starting to maybe look at uh, a Java version of this so we can make a PR against Linkerd. Uh, so that Linkerd could support open tracing in Java. Um, so there's some of this going on right now, and I'll try but, to. Uh, yeah, uh, but but yeah, for Java we have a trace resolver, I think. So it's kind of solution for this. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, that's true. The, I also just wanted to make a quick plug before we finish the call that um, I, I'm going to try and like have a, I'm not sure if it'll be this call or some other call, but some scheduled thing in advance where we'll have people from various companies, not vendors, but companies using tracing, doesn't have to be open tracing, talking about their stuff um, and just have that be kind of a rotating calendar, like half an hour presentations. It would be cool if, if we can get language maintainers then we can have language stuff in separate meetings and then this meeting can be about that kind of high level stuff. I think it'd be fun, frankly. <laughs> and then it might also be uh, useful. Um, so 
I don't know, that'll happen. It might not be in the next call, but certainly starting in March. Yes, that would be nice. Um, if the spec council could start talking about high level spec things again and not just the nitty gritty. All right. And I think that's the call uh, uh, for this week. Um, great to see you all and uh, see you all on Gitter. Um, have a good, have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Ted. Happy New Year. Ciao. Bye.